Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Dear friends in Christ, in Lent we are invited to prepare for the celebration of our Lord's Paschal Mystery. Over this past year, many throughout the world have already walked the road that Jesus himself took, a road of self-giving, suffering, and death. On this day, Palm Sunday, our Lord Jesus Christ entered the city of Jerusalem riding on a donkey, the symbol of humility and peace. And so we come together in spirit, praying for the peace of our world, for peace in our communities, for peace within our own hearts, in the humble acknowledgement of our dependence on God and on each other. The people welcome Jesus with palms and shouts of Hosanna, save us. Today we greet him as our Savior, the one in whom we place our trust and in whom we find our hope, a king whose crown was thorns and whose throne was a cross, a God who united himself to our suffering that we might share in his resurrection. Lord Jesus, again, we cannot gather in person, and again, many this year are without palm branches to raise in your honor. We do, however, all have these palms. So I'm going to ask you now to raise your hands and stretch them out towards us as we ask Jesus' blessing on the palms. Bless and use these palms, the only ones we may have to offer you, so that they might do your bidding to comfort, uplift, and encourage. We ask this in the name of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.
A reading from the letter of Paul to the Philippians. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of slave, being born in human likeness. And being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God also highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bend, in heaven and on earth and, on, and under the earth. And every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is the Lord, to the glory of God the Father, the word of the Lord. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Mark. When they were approaching Jerusalem at Bethphage and Bethany, near the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the village ahead of you, and immediately as you enter it, you will find tied there a coat that has never been written. Untie it and bring it. If anyone says to you, why are you doing this? Just say this. The Lord needs it and will send it back here immediately. They went away and found a colt tied near a door outside in the street. As they were untying it, some of the bystanders said to them, what are you doing untying the colt? They told them what Jesus had said, and they allowed them to take it. Then they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks on it, and he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road, and others spread leafy branches that they had cut in the fields. Then those who went ahead and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our ancestor David. Hosanna in the highest heaven. Then he entered Jerusalem and went into the temple. And when he had looked around at everything, as it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. The Gospel of Christ. I speak to you in the name of the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Amen. So I want to be up front with you. I'm breaking the rules today, but then why should today be any different? Today is the beginning of Holy Week, or as I call it, as a lot of clergy I'm sure call it, Crazy Week. This is the first day, Palm Sunday. At least, that's what most people call today. The official name for today is Passion Sunday with the Liturgy of the Palms. And the day is supposed to begin with the reading of the entry of Jesus into Jerusalem, the gospel passage you just heard. And then later you get the actual gospel for today, which is usually one of the crucifixion narratives from Matthew, Mark, or Luke. John's passion narrative is always used on Good Friday itself. So I'm breaking the rules by simply making today about Palm Sunday. I think the church's thinking is that most Christians will attend two services this week, today's Palm Sunday service and next Sunday's Easter service. And they'll go from Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem to Jesus' triumphal exit out of the tomb, without hearing all the story that unfolds between. Here at St. John's, we've always kept this Sunday focused simply on Palm Sunday. I, I think it works better that way. It also helps that Good Friday has always been one of the best attended services of the year here. And I know there will still be people who skip Good Friday. I don't do Good Friday, I've heard on more than one occasion. It's just so depressing. Well, yes, 
It is hard to make crucifixion upbeat, no matter which hymns you choose for the day. And I do understand why many people who are still wrapped up in their own grief over some tragedy that has occurred in their life may find that service particularly triggering. Although a savior who has also been betrayed and suffered, a God who has watched his own son die, might be the very one you want to share your grief with, especially given Easter's reminder that grief is not where the story ends. But if we know that there is a happy ending, if we know that the cross isn't where the story ends, why not then just skip ahead to that part? I think it's because in our own lives, it doesn't work that way. We don't just get to skip to the happy ending. We have to live through the events that Jesus will go through this week. Which of us haven't seen the injustice and oppression of our political and economic systems, the intolerance and oppression of our religious institutions, and not wanted to turn over a few tables in the, in the halls of power, as Jesus will do? Which of us has also not felt the sting of betrayal by a good friend, or felt the guilt, as Peter does, of being the one who betrays? Who among us has not spent a fearful night waiting and wondering, as the disciples will, if someone we love something that we devoted ourselves to might not be there come morning. Which of us have not carried a cross that we cannot put down, or not stood weeping at the foot of the cross of another person we love, unable to do anything for them except to just suffer alongside them? Which of us have not stood at the side of a tomb, a grave, weeping. You see, we can't avoid these painful events in Jesus's life because we don't get to avoid them in ours either. And our God wants us to know, I am there with you in those painful and frightening parts of your story too. Well, you are here this morning, if you're watching this. So what happens in the story today, Palm Sunday. We often call this the triumphal entry of Jesus into Jerusalem, which is ironic. A triumph was a very specific thing. A Roman triumph was granted to a military leader who had conquered the enemy, and not only that, but could count a specific number of deaths at his own hand to show his courage and his leadership. This procession of Jesus into Jerusalem will draw on all the same symbols, proclaiming that he too has come as a king, as a conquering hero. But as is so often the case, Jesus will turn everything upside down. God's ways are not our ways, and God's kingdom will not, and indeed cannot, unfold in the way that the world's empires are built. So Jesus comes as a king, but isn't the king we think he is. He comes to conquer the enemy, but the enemy isn't who or what we think it is. By sending his disciples to procure a donkey for him to ride into the city on, Jesus is intentionally fulfilling the prophecy of Zechariah, who wrote, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king comes to you, lowly and riding upon a donkey. With this riding on a donkey, Jesus is saying, Yes, I am the king you wait for, but I am nothing like any king you've known, nor will ever know. Pontius Pilate comes in the name of the emperor. I come in the name of God and his kingdom. And don't confuse the two of them, because they are nothing alike. But that's just what the people do. Hosanna, they shout. 
encouraging Jesus in what they thought would be a final showdown between one of their own and the Roman Empire. The word Hosanna means save us. And surely the people thought as they waved their palm branches and shouted, Hosanna, save us, son of David, that Jesus would work miracles, the kind of miracles they'd heard he could work, show that kind of power and drive out the Romans once and for all. They were pleading to be saved from Rome. But Jesus is there to save them, to save us all, not just from a particular emperor or a particular empire, but from the whole culture of empire itself. Everything the empire of Rome, everything that every empire that came before and would come after symbolizes. Jesus wants to save us from empire itself, which lay in their hopes of a a restored kingdom. And we still see that at work in our lives today. Let's consider the the idea of empire for a moment. And, And what does empire even mean? Because we still see it at work in our own lives, even in so called democratic societies. Empire depends on unquestioning loyalty to the leader cult of the executive, we call it sometimes. Whether it's in a country or a corporation, a family or a church, empire exists wherever there's no tolerance for opposition, wherever there's no ability to express differing opinions or the dictates of personal conscience. One person or a small group speaks and the rest obey without question. We see that in the, in the elevation of political leaders and political parties. And if you are against that party or that leader in any way, you are against your whole country. You're against your whole race of people. There is absolutely no opposition allowed or you are branded a traitor and an enemy. That's empire. Empire depends on conquest, whether it's the invasion of a a nation, the suppression of a minority, or the silencing of one you disagree with. Empire exists whenever violence is used to control and to silence the opposition. And we definitely still see that at work in our world, in cultural and political systems that privilege certain people over others, depending on their skin color, on their gender identity, on their orientation. We see it in the continued economic dominance of a very small group of people over controlling all the resources over the vast majority of others. We see it in numerous ways that over the past number of years, many more people, particularly the young, have sought to expose, as Jesus sought to expose the corruption of both temple and empire when he overturned those tables, an act which made those in authority, those invested in the empire, incredibly uncomfortable, so uncomfortable that it basically sealed Jesus' fate. Just as those of us who are still benefiting from the culture of empire wished that all those crying out against it would just be quiet, or at least a little more conciliatory. Much the same way as Jesus' own disciples, Judas, chief among them, felt about Jesus in these days leading up to his death. Empire always depends on us versus them. Whether it comes through political rhetoric religious propaganda, or community gossip. Empire exists whenever people are neatly divided into insiders, those who, like ourselves, have all the virtues, and the outsiders, those who, differing from us, represent all the vices. Have you ever experienced that kind of insider-outsider mentality, that us and them, if you're not for us, you are against us? 
Have you ever participated in that? How different all this culture of empire is from what Paul writes in the, his letter to the Philippians. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ, who, though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptying himself, took the form of a slave and humbled himself, becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. On that first Palm Sunday, what the people saw was God's kingdom arriving in the form of an itinerant rabbi on the back of a humble donkey. And Caesar's empire, entering the city of Jerusalem for Passover in a very different procession, with Pontius Pilate at the head on a stallion, a shining breastplate, a helmet, and an army at his back. And the mistake they made is they thought that Jesus' kingdom was going to overtake Caesar's kingdom by basically just being like Caesar, only more so. But Jesus was there to say, my kingdom looks nothing like that. So you can't expect me or my followers to behave like that. We'll see this conflict between the kingdom of God as represented in Jesus and Caesar's empire again and again in this coming week, which is why it's so important to tell the whole story. We'll see it on Wednesday at Tenebrae, when Judas, tired of waiting for this kingdom that Jesus keeps talking about, decides to force Jesus' hand and makes his own deal, and in one night goes from being Jesus' disciple to a servant of the empire. We'll see it again on Monday, Thursday, When Jesus, at supper with his friends, commands them, mandatum, that's where mandi comes from, commands them to love one another, and then horrifies Peter by demonstrating what that love looks like in a kind of humble service that still makes people uncomfortable as we watch other people get their feet washed. We'll see it again on Friday, a Friday that we strangely call good, when Jesus is tortured and crucified and put to death, and the empire and all that it represents, the powers of this world, seem to have won, as they so often do, until Sunday dawns. And with the kindling of the new Easter fire, we proclaim in the midst of the darkness that it is the light of Christ not the fearful violence and condemnation of the powers of this world that win the day. And it all begins today. It all begins with a procession. It begins with a choice. A choice that determines every step you take, not only this week, but throughout throughout the rest of your life. Will I follow the emperor and place my hope in the power, the wealth, the promises of this world? Or will I follow the Lord and pledge myself to his kingdom? It is a busy, emotional, spiritually challenging week. It's a holy week. It's a crazy week. So why not be crazy? Why not attend worship even when it's not Sunday? Why not come two days in a row, or or three, or heck, make it four? Be part of this holy, crazy, life-changing story of how God's humble but powerful love triumphs over fear and violence, over sin, over death itself, and still does. Amen.
Jesus, Son of Man, 
We pray for all who are suffering physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually, especially those who have asked for our prayers, for all who are growing weary under lockdown, and all who are missing their family and friends and their church community. Let us pray. with Mary Magdalene on the day of resurrection. Let us pray.
gathering all our prayers into one, let us pray as our Savior taught us. Our, our Father, who art in heaven, heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Lord Jesus, as you entered the city of Jerusalem, many blessed you and followed you in procession. Bless us and all that we offer you this day, and give us grace to continue following you even when the road becomes difficult and painful, trusting in the resurrection that lies beyond the cross. We ask this in the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. The, the peace, peace of, of the Lord, Lord be always, always with, with you. you. The Lord who has come to save us, lead you and support you this coming week as you walk with him the way of humble service, the way of self-giving love, the way of the cross. And the blessing of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you all this day and always. Amen. Amen.